Many people watch The Queen's Gambit a couple of times, mostly to understand the chess moves, but also to take note of the hidden details. In case you missed anything, here are some of the clues, details, and references from the hit show as compiled by Riveted. Beth's name. Elizabeth Beth Harmon is a chess prodigy and the main character in the Netflix miniseries The Queen's Gambit. Orphaned at a young age and scarred from the Methuen's home's mistreatment, she's depicted as someone with immense anger and passion, which fuels her chess proficiency and her susceptibility to substance addiction. It's no coincidence either that Beth shares a name with Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, or that her surname, Harmon, means soldier in German. Beth is a soldier on the chessboard that becomes queen. Judith Pulgar Inspiration Beth Harmon's character is inspired by numerous real-world chess players, most pressingly, Judith Pulgar, a Hungarian grandmaster who is female, a redhead, and regarded as both the strongest female chess player of all time and incredibly attractive. Pulgar rarely attended female-specific tournaments and made a point out of competing in open tournaments dominated overwhelmingly by men. However, unlike Pulgar, Harmon is portrayed as someone who neglects the importance of gender and does not frequently compare herself to male players. Interestingly, The Queen's Gambit, the novel written by Walter Tevis, which the miniseries is based on, was published in March of 1983, nearly three years before Polgar began garnering fame as a child chess prodigy. At the time, a female chess-playing top-rated GMs was still a fantasy, yet the book appears to predict Polgar's rise to fame as it features a woman that makes a point out of competing in tournaments dominated by men. Bobby Fischer Inspiration Bobby Fischer won the famous Game of the Century at 13 years old. At age 14, he became the youngest ever U.S. chess champion, and at 15, he became both the youngest grandmaster and the youngest candidate for the world championship. Coincidentally, Beth wins the 1967 U.S. championship the year Fisher won his eighth and final American title. After her adopted mother dies in Mexico City, Beth, who's in her late teens, finds herself living alone. In comparison, soon after Fisher's older sister Joan married and moved out, his mother, Regina, also moved out to pursue a medical degree. That left Fisher at 16, living on his own. Fisher was somewhat antisocial and one-dimensional, and there was little that he liked to talk about outside of chess. Beth is more likable, a necessity for a leading character in a show, but she has some similar traits. She learns Russian in order to be prepared to face the Soviet players. Fisher taught himself Russian so that he could read Russian chess journals, which were the best sources of information. When Beth needs money to go to Russia, she has the government to pay for the trip. Fisher's mother once picketed the White House to try to raise money for the United States chess team. Finally, Beth and Fisher have a similar, aggressive playing style, and when playing white and facing the Sicilian defense, they both play the same system. The Fisher sews an attack. The Chess Review Beth considers stealing a copy of Chess Review magazine from a convenience store. This is not a made-up detail, but a real publication that ran from 1933 to 1969. Well, some details of the review were a bit mixed up. The September 1963 issue of the magazine features a different cover photo than the real 1963 issue. The real cover featured the three winners of the Piatigorsky Cup. Beth also picks up another edition of the magazine, this time with Benny Watts featured on the cover. This issue also existed in reality, although Benny Watts' face has replaced that of famed chess prodigy Bobby Fischer. The real Fischer edition was issued in October of 1963. Caro Khan Defense Beth is nearly defeated by Harry Beltic, an older player with a fierce competitive streak. One of the ways Beltic is able to beat Beth is by employing a specific chess strategy known as the Caro Khan Defense. However, Beth does not learn about such defense until Benny teaches her after her defeat to Beltic. The Karo Khan defense is a strategy marked by the moves 1 e4 c6 to combat the king's pawn opening. It is similar to the Sicilian defense that Beth masters throughout the series. Only chess experts probably understood the Karo Khan defense, and the rest of us were certainly clueless. Beth vs. Benny Beth suffers a chess defeat to the Doctor Who dressed Benny Watts, the rogue prodigy who has resigned from a life of tournament play. Benny and Beth first met at the Cincinnati Open in 1963 when Benny was confidingly talking about various chess strategies to a group of chess players. Later, the two meet again at the U.S. Open in Las Vegas in 1966, and they played against each other. The first ten moves of the match are shown on screen, seven of which are a version of the Schwedenegan Sicilian defense known as the Sozin variation. The moves also incorporate the Najdorf variation, which is mentioned in passing during the first episode and reinforced by the discussion of Argentinian Grandmaster Miguel Najdorf. Again, another iconic move that probably went over your head if you're not a chess expert. Morphe Duke match with a Rook Bishop. In the episode Adjournment, Beth and Benny play a round of competitive speed chess. The final combo of winning moves is taken move for move from the infamous 1858 match between Paul Morphy and Duke Carl Count Isward. At the end of the match, the camera hovers over the chess pieces and the board recreates the final position of the Morphe Duke match with a Rook Bishop winning combo move. A real book reference. The book that Mr. Scheibel gives to Beth in the first chapter, Openings, is littered with hidden details. A real book that was published in 1911 that chess players often view as the holy grail of opening strategies. Mr. Scheibel gives Beth the seventh edition of the book when she is nine years old. However, later in the series, Beth buys a ninth edition of the same book at a convenience store. A real player reference. 
In the second episode, Exchanges, Beth asks a grade school librarian if they have any books on chess. The librarian ponders for a moment before mentioning the name Jose Capablanca and passing as a potential chess book. Jose Raul Capablanca y Guapera was a real-life Cuban chess player who reigned as a world champion from 1921 to 1927. Like Beth, Capablanca was also a chess prodigy who climbed the ranks as a youth before becoming renowned for his rate of play and endgame expertise. Ben Snyder's Store Beth's adoptive mother, Alma, shows her new daughter a little love by taking her to Ben Snyder's department store to buy cheap, out-of-style school clothing. Ben Snyder's was a real store founded in 1913 and operated in the very Lexington, Kentucky location the show is set in from 1935 to 1980. In the show, a Lexington Bank and Trust building is seen next to Ben Snyder's, but in reality, it would have been the Ben Ali Theater. Real shout-outs! In Episode 5, Benny introduces Beth to a pair of young chess players named Danny Weiss and David Friedman. Only those who follow showrunner Scott Frank's career closely will notice that these names are direct shout-outs to his friends and collaborators, Danny D.B. Weiss and David Benoit, born David Friedman. Chess Outfits The show takes place in the mid-1950s and 1960s, and even though Beth's dressing sense doesn't reflect the typical 60s style, it masterfully reflects the one thing she loves the most, chess boards. Netflix shared some stills from the series where Beth's character is seen sporting plaids and checkered designs and added that costume designer Gabrielle Binder deliberately made use of them to evoke chess boards throughout the series. The color tones used in the series, along with the cinematography and set design, were also praised by fans of the show, who were able to comprehend the subtle references that were being made to the game. Carving Her Own Path In the last scene, Beth literally looks like a queen with a white ensemble. She wears a hat for the first time to symbolize the queen's crown. Beth is told by her U.S. guardian that she has to go to the White House to play a game with the U.S. president and a host of other engagements, but she doesn't feel comfortable with this. Beth is looking for freedom. She no longer wants to be told what to do. She's looking for the freedom to move around the world like a queen with no restrictions, moving as far as she wants in each direction. Harry Porter cameo. Besides showing us what Thomas Brody Sangster, the adorable redhead on the drums in Love Actually Looks Like at Age 30, the show also features another child star you likely haven't seen since you last plunked down for a Harry Potter marathon. Harry Melling, a.k.a. a grown-up Dudley Dursley, who plays Gambit's sweet, supportive pushover Harry Beltic. Symbolism in the last game The final game of the miniseries pits chess prodigy Beth Harmon up against Vasily Borgov. The show starts with Beth always playing as Black. Black goes second in chess and has a slight disadvantage to White because of it. The show, in contrast, ends with her playing as White and becoming a world champion. The opening starts with White moving the Queen's pawn to d4, Black countering with d5, and White offering the Queen's bishop's pawn to Black by moving it to c4. The free pawn that White offers is the gambit. Borgov declines the gambit and moves his king's pawn to e5. The two White pawns represent Beth and her mother, driving headfirst into the truck where her mother is killed. But Beth survives. The game continues, and we see Beth moving her queen's pawn further up the board. If Beth can just move her pawn one step further, it turns into a queen. Beth figures out a way to do this by sacrificing her own queen. This alludes to Beth's mother, who took her own life, but her little pawn, Beth, survives and eventually turns into a queen herself. Beth's Lipstick Each of Beth's lipstick colors were deliberately chosen for each individual scene and helped signify Beth's age as the series progressed. All the colors were specifically planned for the individual scenes and the individual ages. The lipstick Beth wears in the final episode is the exact same shade as the lipstick her adoptive mother wore as an ode to her. It all helps to tell the story and translate the character without the viewer knowing it. Beth's mental state is consistently reflected in her appearance, and even her eyeliner is an indicator of the pill-fueled chaos within. During one of Beth's most tumultuous banders, she attempts to channel a pop singer's aesthetic, but fails miserably. Beth gets incredibly drunk while dancing to I'm Your Venus by Shocking Blue, and then she does this rather outrageous eyeliner to look like lead singer Mariska Vares. So the next day, she decides that she's going to do this makeup again, and does it just incredibly badly, and the makeup reflects how she really feels. The Green Pills the little green tranquilizer pills define Beth's life and her value from her very first day at a Kentucky orphanage. In her childhood, Beth knows them only as one of two vitamins that she receives at the orphanage to help even out her disposition. While Beth's reactions to the sedatives initially seem quaint, it soon becomes clear that the child has gotten hooked. This stage of Beth's life also stakes in reality. A 2018 BuzzFeed investigation into the Catholic orphanage system in 20th century North America found evidence and accounts of nuns turned nurses administering intravenous sedatives to orphans. While the name Zanzolum is fictional, the pill is clearly intended to be a stand-in for real-life benzodiazepines, tranquilizer drugs that act on the brain and central nervous system in order to reduce anxiety, soothe insomnia, and ironically treat withdrawal symptoms. In addition to drawing from historical abuse of benzodiazepines, Tevis also incorporated his own personal experience with addiction. 
Diagnosed at age 9 with rheumatic heart and Sydenham's chorea, he was placed in a convalescent home as a child. As he told Chess Life in 1983, he spent two years in that hospital from the ages of 9 to 11, receiving regular doses of the sedative phenobarbital. A major mistake. Beth becomes the Kentucky State Champion and got there with a perfect score against 1,700 and 1,800 players. She also beat a Grandmaster in Pittsburgh, but she said that her rating was 1,800. She's clearly stronger than 1,800 and her rating would reflect it. She would actually start with a crazy high provisional rating in the 2600s after her initial games. Even if she lost some games, her rating around the point she said she has a rating of 1800 should conservatively be somewhere around 2300 to 2400 plus. So did you pick up something from the Queen's Gambit that we didn't notice? Let us know in the comments section below. This has been Riveted, and we publish amazing videos daily.